Thank you, everybody, for coming. Uh, we have a captive audience. I did offer my students one extra point for <laughs> attendance. We hope to make them captivated by the end of this uh, talk. Uh, thank you, Brian, for inviting me to talk. That's, uh, you know, it, it calls for reflection, so you need to think about you know, where you've been, what, where you're at now, where you're going. Uh, so um, what I study in sport uh, is how people um, think about cause and effect. Uh, what's, you, uh, what's unusual about sport is other things that we, um, we, we, are, um, we encounter or we, we're exposed to is that we see how the game develops. We see the whole, uh, we have a narrative of um, how the two teams compete against each other, how they try to uh, overcome each other, uh, how they try to uh, develop certain strategies, uh, and then we come up with a certain notion of what led to what. Uh, sometimes this notion uh, is correct, is empirically supported, and other times it's not. Uh, so uh, I would say that uh, a main focus of my study in sports, in sports psychology, is to see if indeed there is empirical support to some of those notions that we develop uh, in terms of cause and effect. Um, so that's very broadly. Uh, let's now talk, and I'll show you some other research aside from the, uh, uh, from the herbal research later on and show you the, this pattern of uh, looking for results. So, uh, the herbal shot, okay? Here it is in front of you. The show that fell on a replay to his draws a response from the fans on the video over on the screen. Ten point game. Three by Hope and Airball. That's fine. If you're Maryland, you say, okay. Thurman <laughs> Booker has made seven of those this year, including a huge win in the first time he's. Okay, what a beautiful moment. <laughs> Except for the shooter, I guess he's not having so much fun. Uh, but it seems that everybody else is having fun. Uh, so, uh, first mention of the elbow shot, the term is uh, in the 60s, the late 60s, actually coming from California. So, this is the shot, elbow shot. Uh, in terms of the elbow chant, the response by the crowd, uh, that is credited to a game between North Carolina and Duke, quite appropriately, a few years after. So, uh, <clears throat> what we're going to look at uh, is the elbow shot from different perspectives. So, um, first thing that we did is we went to uh, basketball players here at USD and at SDSU, and we asked them about their elbow shots, uh, how frequent it is, uh, does it hurt them, do they pay attention, uh, that's the first thing. So, memories, conception that basketball players dealing with the elbow chant and the shot they had to deal with. Then we conducted observational and archival research. So uh, we looked at the crowd. How did the crowd respond? When was the um, response uh, stronger? Um, under what circumstances? And then we looked at the players. Did the, the, the elbow chant, the ABC, influence the performance in the subsequent shot? Uh, so that's the, that encapsulates the, um, the series of uh, studies I'm going to show you next. So uh, the elbow shot needs to be uh, uh, analyzed in the context of the home field advantage. The home field advantage is the, the, the consistent, robust pa pattern that we find that home teams do better than away teams. Uh, and that could be for, for a variety of factors. One of them is the crowd having a partisan crowd that is supporting you, that potentially can put pressure on the uh, referee as well, seems to be working to the advantage of the home team. So a a ABS is from now on the, the shot itself. ABC is the chant that comes subsequently. And if we are talking about the uh, home field advantage, obviously you need to recognize that when a player by the home team launches an elbow shot, an ABS, there's not going to be any chant, usually. Okay, so uh, this is something that is within the location, the locale of where the game is being played. So 
Uh, we, uh, again, went to uh, the teams at USD, the basketball teams at USD and SDSU, and we asked them, uh, where are we more likely to see uh, an air ball shot? And uh, quite convincingly, uh, almost all of them said in an away game. Uh, some said equally, nobody said in a home, in a home game. Uh, that makes sense, right? Because um, potentially you know the court better, right? You, are, you practice there on a daily basis. Uh, that's not the case when you go and play uh, an away game. Uh, but it's also possible, it's also possible that the recollection is skewed because of the crowd's reaction, right? Because when the crowd is chanting, following, it registers, right? And we have to recognize that in sports there are many ways in which biases can prevail. Um, <clears throat> one of it is that we don't come and watch games usually because we are non-partisans. We, have, we are motivated, right? We have a side that we support, and that could influence the way we observe the game. If we watch on TV, there is a commentator, right, or an announcer, and they kind of lead us to think that certain things the way, are the way they are. So players think that you're more likely to launch an air ball shot for in an away a game rather than a home, but again, we don't know if this is indeed supported empirically because it may register differently. And indeed, in our study, when we looked at uh, archivally, so we looked at the season of, of college uh, games, uh, we watched, we, well, not me personally, but my team of RAs uh, observed 139 games. In 124 of them, there was an elbow shot. So, and overall, we had 354 elbow shots overall. So it's quite, it happens quite, quite uh, frequently. We do not find, so this is not statistically different. So it, it leads us to the, the, um, the, the, the tenuous conclusion that it's actually about what registers following. The fact that the, the crowd responds, then we recall it more when asked what's the frequency. Uh, we actually found that, uh, so what's not shown here is neutral locations. So some games are played in neutral locations, whether the, it's the league's tournament or the, uh, the, the national tournament, and that's actually where you get more uh, elbow shots, but again, this is confounded with how important is the game. So um, we should be cautious about uh, concluding beyond. So um, what we do see in how uh, players responded is certainly self-serving bias. So we asked them, uh, the uh, following an ABC, a chat, how likely is your performance to deteriorate? And then we ask them, how likely is other people's performance to deteriorate? So as you can see, right, their performance, not really, others more so, right? So they're somehow, they're immune, uh, but others not so much. And the next one, uh, it's not a knock on the uh, current team, okay? But uh, when, the, when we pose the questionnaire, when we ask the questions, <laughs> Uh, there was a notable difference in the quality of the teams, SDSU and USD, uh, as shown by the, uh, the players, the, the stars at the time. Uh, Johnny D, I don't know how many of you know him, uh, but I think you'd agree that Kawhi Leonard is better. Um, so the team, the SDSU team at the time was much, much better than uh, USD. Uh, and we see that if you, so in both teams you see a self-serving bias, so that their performance is less impacted by, uh, by the crowd chant, and, but it seems that SDSU is actually lower than USD. They seem to be more confident in dealing with it. Uh, so again, the team generally was more successful at the time. Uh, this is how much attention do you pay to the chant, and again, we see a difference between the team. So I assume that generally they minimize, they do not want to, uh, to admit to uh, to the crowd affecting their performance, but we see a difference between the two teams. Uh, now, let's move on, let's transition into uh, looking at the crowd's response. Um, and uh, the, the um, research into crowds, crowd psychology was a long standing, has a long standing tradition in social psychology. Uh, Gustave Le Bon, who wrote uh, the first dedicated book to uh, crowds, uh, didn't have very good opinion of crowds 
uh, impulsive, uh, irritable, incapacity to reason, uh, absence of judgment, and so on. I think his notions were a little bit influenced by the fact that in France, years back, if you saw a crowd of people coming at you, and you were of higher social uh, class, your neck was in, in trouble. So I think that might have been influencing his conception of, uh, of crowds. Um, so uh, obviously crowd noise is the p one of the pillars of the home field advantage. Um, what's great about the elbow shot is it's a, such a crystallized stimulus response moment in time. Usually when you have crowds, it's chaotic, it's noisy, you're not sure exactly what is the crowd uh, pointing their attention to, what are they responding to, but this is, as you could see from that uh, one example, this is, you know exactly what happened and you know what they're responding to. Uh, so, uh, why, uh, why do they chant? One of the reasons, obviously, is they try to impact the performance of the player on the, on the, on the court but there are other reasons why they chant. So um, enhanced attachment towards other uh, fans in their camp, increased confidence, co collective efficacy, and just general stamina. Uh, but uh, we are going to focus on, uh, on the tr attempt to influence uh, elbow shooters. Uh, so as I mentioned, um, we watched, against not we, uh, my RAs, uh, 139 uh, games, we, in most of them we had an <coughs> airball shot. Uh, the breakdown is 131 were launched by away players, 114 were by the home players, and 109 occurred in neutral courts. And I should uh, credit my uh, co-author, Damian Vera, who was a student here and then went on to, be, um, to do uh, an MBA at UCSD. Uh, without him, this project, which was a, a big project, wouldn't have happened. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, the, so 124, 35% of the total elbow shots, the crowd chanted at least once, okay? In most cases, the chanting included only one sustained episode after which the crowd relented, but sometimes they keep on going after the same player. So immediately following, they chant, and then if they really feel that they are into it, Whenever the player gets the ball again on offense, they will chant again, air ball, air ball, to remind the player. Again, this is not very frequent, but it happens. Uh, and ever, and so the average, when an ABC was heard, the, AB, the, the player launching the, the shot was subjected to 5.36 unique chants. Air ball, air ball, air ball, five of this is the, this is the mean, and you have the standard deviation and the range. One of them was subjected to 38 times air ball. Uh, I don't know. Uh, okay, so this is the, uh, the breakdown of where air balls are launched. Uh, if we uh, try to, uh, sh to be more, uh, so this is probably a better depiction. Uh, most of them, 45% plus, are beyond the three-point arc. Uh, 33, so about 34% are between the paint and the arc, and about 21% are in the paint. Uh, and then we looked, so now we are looking of whether, so it's a regression analysis, and we are looking at only away games, only away games, because again, we should not expect the crowd to chant air ball in home games, and whether it did or it didn't, right? So it's a binary logistic, yes or no. Not this, how sustained it is, I'll show you how sustained it is later on, but this is yes or no. And we looked at the following variables. So those are the predictive variables, right? So we know crowd chanting yes, no. Uh, whether the player was a starter or not, that was one uh, variable that we looked at. We, we, we were wondering whether the crowd is likely to target the starters. Those are known to be the stronger players. Maybe those are the ones that you really need to shake their confidence. Or maybe they'll go for a non-starter maybe a weaker player, and maybe those are the ones that are more likely to be harmed by the chanting. Uh, we wanted to see whether the crowd is sensitive to the shot taken by this player before. So maybe if he already missed one, they're going to go after him even more doggedly because they know that this is likely to trigger uh, lesser of a performance. 
Uh, by the way, I didn't say that. If you have questions, if I'm not, if something is missing in, uh, in my description, raise your hand and let me know as, as I speak. Um, then we looked at whether uh, the possession was maintained. So sometimes they, of course, they don't try to shoot an air ball, but sometimes when, when an air ball is shot, it makes for a chaotic scene because everybody is expecting the ball to bounce off, the, or either to be made or to be bounced off the, off the rim or, or the, the backboard. When it's, when it's, an, which an, when it's uh, an air ball shot, it just, nobody is expecting it. And sometimes it actually falls into the hand of an offensive, another teammate, an offensive player, and that's, that, that's just golden. That's usually just putting it in the basket, right? So what's the outcome? And again, the outcome you have to realize is nothing of the intention of the player. The air ball shooter is trying to score a basket, right? But sometimes, haphazardly, good things come out of it. Uh, then we looked at continuous variables, so we looked at crowd density. We did um, attendance over capacity of the stadium uh, to see whether, obviously, if they are closer to each other, if there are no gaps, right, that the message can travel uh, better and they are likely to have a sustained or more a, a response. And the last variable is the elbow distance, okay? Are elbows launched from afar? more likely to trigger an elbow, an elbow chant versus those um, closer, closer ones. So here it is in front of you, the, uh, the determining p-value by which we live, uh, psychologists. Uh, and the two uh, variables that we did find an association, right? So this is a regression. It's not an experiment. We do not uh, randomly assign variables, so we cannot say this is leading to this, but we can just report an association between variables. And the two variables that we found an association with is the outcome, right? So if haphazardly it falls into the hands of a teammate, and then likely to be scored again, right? Then they do not chant, okay? And another one is the AB, ABS distance. So whatever is below 0.05 is considered significant. Uh, the distance. So those shots, elbow shots launched from the three-point line or further away, not the three-point, further away are more likely to be subjected to chance. Um, in some respects, it's counterintuitive because uh, as the, the shot is further away, it's more difficult and thus an air ball is more likely. But of course, the crowd is partisan, right? And they, it seems, are they're trying to hurt those who try to hurt them the most. So a three-point shot is 50% more than a two-point shot, right? So maybe they should go specifically about after those players. Also, you need to think about how it unravels, right? So the, again, the example that we had, he was standing on a three-point line, and he shot, and he touched nothing, right? So there was a there was a trajectory, a long trajectory. Suspense was building, right? And then it hit nothing. Right? If you shoot under the basket, someone grabs the rebound, you go for a fast break or so on, things keep on going, right? So sometimes it's about the, uh, the time that it takes, the suspense that is building, and then the response by uh, the crowd. Uh, so this is uh, just a different way of showing the results. So we just uh, we did it in a dichotomous manner rather than, uh, rather than a distance as a continuous measure. And you do see an interaction here where upon chanting is significantly more likely when the air ball shot is made from a three, beyond the three-point line rather than the two-point line. Okay, uh, this is testing the same, the same crowd response but in a linear logistics. So this is how long they persisted rather than yes, no, did they chant or didn't they chant? When they chanted, how long did they go? And here we see that the only one that's significant is the distance, right? So again, if uh, the air ball shot was made beyond the three-point arc, then the crowd's response was uh, sustained, was longer than if it was um, bit, uh, closer to the basket. So again, a moment in time that can, we can analyze the crowd's <coughs> response. Uh, and if we put it in the theory, in a theoretical level, uh, often we, uh, we mention social identity theory when we discuss relationship between groups, between the in-group and the out-group. And based on this theory, um, in essence, as we go our, 
about our lives, we are looking for high self-esteem, right? We're looking to boost our self-esteem. And we can boost our self-esteem in uh, three main ways. Things that we achieve in life that we can attribute to the self. Uh, but we can also uh, bask in reflected glory when our in-group is doing very well, right? This is another way, even though we didn't do anything specific about that, if our in-group is doing well, we feel good about it. But another way to achieve high self-esteem is through derogating the out-group, right? So derogating the out-group is another way to achieve high self-esteem. Might be not the most uh, benevolent way to do so, but it seems that those crowds actually manage to uh, increase their self-esteem by derogating uh, opposing, opposing players when they really perform um, sub -parly. Okay, um, let's move on. Uh, I'll spare you this one. Uh, or shouldn't I? Maybe I shouldn't. This is Kobe Bryant in his uh, first year in the NBA. He's very young. And he's doing very poorly. Luckily for him, it stopped. <laughs> Let's see if we can. Okay, uh, four elbows in five minutes. Okay, that's quite an achievement. Uh, he's uh, in his rookie year, and for him, uh, upon reflection, he says this was the lowest, the lowest low of his career. He, um, the team just lost to uh, the Utah Jazz in the, uh, in the playoffs. He goes back, he flies back to LA, he goes to the gym in the middle of the night, and he starts shooting, and from there on, it's a great story. Uh, but uh, now we shift the focus to the player. Right, the one who is being subjected to the chance. Uh, and the question is, uh, does it influence his performance, his subsequent performance? So this type of research uh, rests within ego threat research uh, that has, again, long been the interest of uh, uh, social cognitive psychologists. Uh, and the problem with most of this research is that it's done in the laboratory. And what they do is they bring you in and they give you a test, and uh, you're randomly assigned to be told, oh, you did atrociously, so obviously they don't check what your response is, or you've done superbly, okay, random assignment, and then they test your performance on the subsequent test, right? And then they, they assess whether ego threat uh, influence your future performance. Uh, I think that this type of study has a limited external validity because it's not really clear whether the uh, participants care about the type of test that they are given. Um, and if they don't care, again, the, 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 the manipulation is not a strong one. Uh, what we know about research in sports is that uh, the participants, the players in archival research, they try hard and they know the roots, which I'm not sure is true. I also conduct laboratory research. I'm not sure. Okay, uh, but I, we know that uh, the participants in, in, in those studies really try hard and they know the rules. So, um, sports, again, allows the study of performance in, uh, in, in real, in naturalistic setting, where we know that the players cherish their uh, success and failure is considered a genuine threat. So, uh, in terms, again, of uh, when players are targeted, we see that uh, chants are significantly more likely to happen in away games rather than home games. So sometimes it does happen in home games when the two teams are um, close geographically. So you will have some uh, students travel to the, uh, to the uh, away game, and it's going to be an, uh, a home game for the, for the, for the shooter. Uh, this is the number of chants, again, much, many more in the away than the home. Uh, and again, we looked at the following uh, variables, and what we tested here is the performance of the shooter 
in the shot subsequent to the elbow shot. Okay? Um, so we looked at location. So again, there is correlation, there is an association between home and away and chanting, but it's not 100%. So you have games, away games, that there is no chanting, and you have home games that there is chanting again if, if, if fans travel to that location uh, from an away uh, location. Uh, we looked again, so we, so we looked at them separately. Location is one, uh, yes or no, home away, crowd, elbow chanting, uh, whether the player was a starter. Uh, the density again, so uh, uh, attendance over capacity and season shooting. So now we wanted to see whether better shooters following an elbow, are they able, able to recover better in the subsequent shot than those who are lesser shooters? And I just want to show you, so again, you, uh, my team of research assistants observed uh, many games and we recorded where were the shots taken from, at what time, uh, how long it took them to launch the subsequent shot. So this is shot success at home prior to the air ball shot. So right, we recorded the game, we, we detected an air ball, we went back and we saw whether they were successful or not in the shot prior. This is the uh, location of all the air balls at home. This is the shooting success at home after air ball, okay? Now, this is the shot success uh, away prior to air ball. Those are air ball away, and those are shooting success in a way following an air ball. So this requires a lot of work. Uh, and this is of interest. So we are looking at the difference in the subsequent shot. And the difference is indeed significant. So what we did find is that game location makes a difference, whereas um, um, crowd chanting does not, right? So we could not find an association between the chanting and greater likelihood to miss the shot subsequent to airborne. But we did find that if you play an away game, you are more likely to miss the shot following airborne than in a home game. That we did find. So it's a question of location rather than the crowd's response. I guess the crowd would have liked us to find an association. We were not able to establish one. Um, it seems that what happens is when you travel, you are to some degree depleted to begin with, right? You travel, you're out of your um, daily routine, you're tired. Uh, when you shoot an air ball, you do not need the crowd to remind you or to let you know that you performed in a subpar way, right? You, you, you see what happened, right? Your shot did not touch anything. The crowd response seemed to be, in this case, redundant, right? When you are playing in a home game, right? You're well rested, right? And thus, it does not influence you. But if you're in an away game, and you're to begin with somewhat depleted, then the elbow shot itself is likely to impair your performance and subsequently you are more likely to miss. Okay, that's the, that's the, uh, the take home message. Okay, now. One question. Yes. Back on slide. What about the season shooting? R right, so, so right, right. So that's, that's a good, that it's good that you uh, remind me. Season shooting does seem to provide a buffer so that better shooters, Better shooters seem to rebound better from air ball shots as opposed to uh, worse shooters. Okay, so this does provide a buffer. So what we, uh, yeah, so, yeah, so that's the, uh, now what we have to be careful about when you do this type of research, you need to be careful um, to look into broader uh, forces that might be at play and you may conclude mistakenly that what you were looking at was the driving the effect, but it might be much a broader effect. So what we need to look at is the home field advantage in general, right? Because it might be, so we are looking at the shot following the elbow, 
right? And we see differences. But it might be that those differences are predicated on the home field advantage. It's nothing to do with the elbow shot, right? We just build a great story here, a great narrative about the elbow shot, but it might be that any shot that you're going to look at, right, is predicated on the home field advantage, right, or the home or uh, away field disadvantage, and it's not based on the elbow shot. So that's why we looked at the shot prior to the elbow, and you see that the uh, the shot, right, prior we do not see those differences. We see those differences only in the shot subsequent to the elbow, and this gives us greater conviction that it's the experience before the elbow that brought about those changes subsequently rather than the general elbow uh, phenomenon that might be driving the effect. So uh, I mentioned that. This is in line with ego depletion. So again, the point I'm trying to, to make here is that um, it's about um, whether you're depleted or not. If you're in an away game, uh, you are more depleted, you have less resources to deal with uh, pressure, uh, and thus you are more prone to, uh, to perform not as well when you uh, don't do to begin with uh, very well. Uh, but again, we do not find the connection with the crowd chanting specifically. We find it whether uh, you play a home or away game. Uh, <clears throat> so, The finding also is not so um, unique in the sense that we, uh, when we look at other research about the home field advantage, we see that uh, most of the effect seems to be, dri be driven by the pressure that the crowd uh, uh, has over the referees rather than the players. The players are trying their best, right? It's kind of easier for them. They know who's their rival, who's their opponent. They go at it and they try to do their best. And they expect the crowd to be uh, at times antagonistic or at times support, supporting. It's pretty, pretty easy. The, uh, the people that have the hardest time dealing with the pressure by the, by the crowd are actually the referees, right? Trying to maintain objectivity is really, really hard, right? Going at someone where you know what other roles are, you know that you need to do your best in order to, to win, is rather easy. Trying to maintain objectivity is really, really hard. So uh, I'd like to show you, so here I'm going to show you a series of studies that extend beyond the, uh, the, free th the, the elbow shot. And again, with the attempt to try to, um, to support or uh, not support conceptions that people have about sports, about cause and effect. So, um, I don't know if you know this guy. He retired a few years back. Ed Hockley, uh, the, bicep, uh, the biceps uh, referee. Uh, uh, so, uh, you always need to know when to exploit opportunities. So his daughter was a student in my class. Said, oh, this is the time where NFL officials will answer my questionnaire. Otherwise, who cares? Uh, and we asked them about their uh, conceptions of uh, what drives the home field advantage. What do they think is driving? And we gave them a list of factors. Uh, and then we asked NFL fans what they thought. And you see that there is quite, quite an agreement on fans influencing the player. They perceive that to be the strongest uh, factor, travel, weather. Where they differ is fans' influence on officials, right? So. NFL fans see that this is a credible, I mean, it's lesser than the others, but a credible source of influence driving the home field advantage. NFL referees, no, they don't. They think that they are somehow immune. So we see, again, ego threat and how you uh, try to deal with it and you try to minimize uh, others' effects on you as you perform in sports. And I'll show you another example soon. So uh, this is the number of games decided in error. Error referees, you see the NFL officials in three leagues think that they are significantly less than NFL fans. Uh, another uh, topic that I explore uh, consistently is gender. Uh, and um, of interest to me is how competitive women are in comparison to men. Now, it's hard 
to, uh, to ask the question because obviously men are more powerful uh, than women physically and they can overwhelm them. Uh, so uh, you, the question is, but competitiveness has nothing to do with physical strength. So we were thinking which sports can we look at that can assess the competitiveness of men versus women that, has, that doesn't have the physical component. And uh, we decided that we're going to look at rifle shooting. Uh, and our first, our first thought was that let's go to the Olympics, right? That's where the best shooters in the world um, perform. Let's look whether there are differences. But what we, what we found out is that they shoot from a different distance and they have different number of attempts. So it's really, really hard to compare between them. So we went to the NCAA ranks. Uh, in the NCAA, they compete one against the other. Uh, and we looked at the, uh, the, the um, national tournament, the best shooters in the NCAA ranks. And we looked first at the team performance. Uh, and there's no difference between males and females in shooting ability uh, along those seven years. Uh, and then, those, the best ones in the team competition go to compete individually, right? So, uh, and when you compete individually, it's harder than when you compete in the, uh, uh, within a team. And then we looked at uh, individual performance of males and females. They compete similarly. There's no, there are no individual differences. There are no gender differences between them. And then when we uh, explored a little bit further, we learned that they used to compete in the Olympics one against the other, up until 92. In 92, something happened. For the first time, a woman won the gold medal. And that could not happen. So what they did is in 96, women did not compete anymore. In 2000, it emerged as a separate segregated sport where, again, they shoot from different distance and, from, uh, and they have different attempts. So this is really blatant uh, bias. Uh, and I'm happy to say that in the next Olympics, uh, they're actually going to compete one against the other. I would like to take the credit that uh, my study <laughs> is the one that uh, made the difference, but it would be a little bit of a show off. OK. Uh, uh, again, ego threat. Uh, this is, um, so I don't know how much time we have. Should I, I can, I have several few more. So uh, this is uh, a quote from uh, an NFL kicker, um, uh, Lawrence Ty Ty Tynes, uh from the Giants. And he uh, re was referring to icing the kicker. OK, so icing the kicker is when the opposing coach is asking, when it's a crucial kick, is asking for a timeout uh, before uh, the execution of the kick. Now, usually we think of getting more time as a good thing. Right? Whenever I tell my students, you have two more days to submit your homework, they are delighted, uh, which I actually did this week. But uh, in the NFL ranks, it's considered a hindrance. And supposedly, uh, what happens is they, in the other time, the, free, uh, the, the, the timeout is not intended for any, any other reason but to ice the kicker. So supposedly, the kicker now has to deal with the other time to contemplate what's going to happen if he misses this crucial kick and how his life is going to turn really badly. He's, not going, to, he's going to be unemployed and so on, right? So uh, it's, it is thought as a, as a hindrance. And uh, he said, uh, perfect coaches are going to learn not to do that, to ice. I don't know what the statistic is, but it would be interesting to see if someone did a study. So he was challenging me, but he didn't know that. I think you'll find more makes and misses after a timeout, just to guess. So again, ego threat, they say, oh, we love being iced because it gives us time to assess the wind, to, um, uh, to wave to our girlfriend, whatever it is, right? It's, it's a good thing. Uh, we actually found in this case that icing the kicker is actually detrimental. So what coaches are doing, so this is Pressure kick was defined as one minute or less to the end of the game when the kicking team was behind three points or less or during overtime. And again, an archival research. And we find a significant difference of 14% uh, where of obviously you control for distance. Distance is crucial. Uh, if, it, if a timeout is taken uh, by the opposing coach, the performance 
it deteriorates significantly. Um, this is not the case when your own coach is asking for the timeout. So um, you could postulate what, what's going on there. Obviously, it's not an experiment again, so we can just postulate, but the act itself seems to be uh, working and is detrimental to uh, uh, kickers. A uh, few more. So um, this is, uh, as a student, as a psychology student, I remember that the first study uh, that I was presented with was this Loftus and Palmer study, uh, which um, is quite famous also uh, beyond psychology circles, where uh, participants are shown a crash between two cars, and it's labeled as either how, f and the question is following, uh, how fast were the, the, uh, the cars were going when they contacted each other, hit each other, bumped or collided or smashed into each other. And supposedly, the, the verb used to describe the collision influences the uh, estimation of, of speed. And as you supposedly increase the magnitude, right, of the, of the verb involved, you see higher speeds involved with the same, when you observe the same, the same collision between two cars. So uh, uh, we decided to look at it uh, through uh, a different prism, prism, sports. And in hockey, players tend to glide towards each other uh, and collide. Uh, and uh, we try to uh, replicate the original results, and we couldn't. So they watched players colliding, we, they, show, they, they watched other things as well, and then one of the scenes was two players colliding, and then we gave them a questionnaire like she did, like, a, like the original study, and we described it as either contact, bump, or smash, and we found similar uh, speeds. No, the, the description itself did not make a difference in speed. And this is something that I probably should uh, mention here, that we have a problem in uh, mostly cognitive and social psychology, especially co uh, social psychology, where we fail to replicate. Um, um, I'm going to plug in an event that we're going to have next uh, semester. We are bringing uh, Professor uh, Brian Nusek, who is a replication expert, uh, to uh, provide, to shed, some data, to shed some light on the replication crisis that we have in psychology. So, failure to replicate. However, when we added a commentator, so rather than describing it after the fact, commentators, announcers, they do the work, while they were colliding, he either described it as a contact, bump, or smash. Here we found differences, but in the opposite direction that the original study found, whereupon smash is actually the least in terms of speed as opposed to contact. So it might be that the descriptions are context-specific because, for example, contact, contact sports is, denotes much strength in this specific uh, domain, right? Whereas maybe contact might be denoting something weak in other contexts. So um, let me see. Do we have? Okay, the last one, I think. So uh, uh, this is actually not published. This is something <coughs> that we are working on now. Uh, and uh, as Brian said before, uh, one of my interests is in aggression and violence in sport. Uh, and the NHL is unique in that it allows players to fight, okay? You are in any other of the major leagues, if you fight, if you fight you're out, you're ejected. And so, so players don't, don't, don't fight because they want to be on the field, they want to they wanna they wanna play well, and they want to get good salaries. In the NHL, in order to be thrown out of a game, you need to fight three times, okay? So what do they do? They fight the maximum two, and then they don't do the third one. Uh, but uh, it is so ingrained in the culture that there are many reasons. So, so fans and the league developed reasoning why to maintain the practice. It has nothing to do with the game, right? Um, and uh, one of those, one of the reasons uh, that uh, is provided is the momentum shift argument. That supposedly, if your team is not doing very well. Uh, if you get into a fight and you win the fight, you prevail over your opponent, you hit them as hard as you can, they fall to the ice, the other players see how much you sacrificed, 
and how well you fought, and this brings about, uh, um, I don't know what to say, but you know, they, they, they rise to the occasion and they manage to win the game. So uh, this is a question that we uh, looked at, and uh, I would say that the culture is so uh, perverted that there are dedicated websites that you can vote to who won the fight. Okay, so for example, this is uh, uh, hockeyfights.com, and you can vote whether this guy won the fight, this one, or was it a, was it a draw? Okay, and so we looked at their how they voted. So we did home minus away, and then we looked at who won the game eventually. And we do not find. So I I conduct this research with Michael Apostol, uh, and we are. Uh, we, we, uh, we use quartiles, so this is when the uh, away player really won the fight, right, based on the voting from the website. This is when they wanted some, this is when the home, uh, home fighter wanted some, and this is when the home, home fighter wanted decisively. And generally, we do not see that winning the fight uh, makes a difference on the final outcome of the game. So I think the league really should, even, even, and even if it did, it probably would not morally uh, be, you know, th that shouldn't be part of the game. But uh, we hope that this study with others uh, will um, uh, cause the league to change its, uh, its um, rules. Because one has to recognize that fighting is mostly done by enforcers so there are specialized players that do the fighting it's not all of them do the fighting they are enforcers and those enforcers are just like boxers and in recent years um, four or five of them uh, either committed suicide or ended their life prematurely it's a little bit murky but they show CTE they so they show signs of CTE so this is has real consequences and they are victims to this practice it's not just uh, um, it has, again, real victims. Okay, so uh, I'm done. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Last question. So we still have 10 minutes for some questions. So please, down on the floor. Yes, Cameron. Um, I was wondering if you looked at uh, how long, um, with the air ball effect, if you looked at how long before they took their next shot. Because it might be that it's their confidence doesn't affect their shot whether they make or miss, but affects whether they want to take another shot. Yes, we did. So uh, thank you. That was not an invited question. Uh, yes, uh, yes, we did. We looked at time. So we thought maybe they just wait longer, right? They are, their confidence has been shaken. They're going to take time, and then they'll come back. So we didn't find differences in time, and we also did not find differences in terms of the distance that the shot is launched in the subsequent shot, right? So another way to increase your, uh, to build up your uh, confidence again is to attempt shots much closer to the basket where you, 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 you're more likely to succeed. So no difference in, in, those two, in those two elements, yes? Was there any difference between overall shooting percentage, home game versus away, compared to the air ball? We did not, but I mean, generally there is a difference in based on the home field advantage. Was it any different? Uh, you saw you're it talking. Increase, you're talking. Know? You're talking about the game overall, or you're talking. We, we, what are we talking about? Well, yeah. If, if a team shoots fifty percent at home and forty-three percent on the road, was that mm -hmm. correlated at all? Uh, so we did specifically. We did not look at it in our research, uh, but there is generally there is a difference that is predicated on the home field advantage. Yes. Uh, was there anything looking at the time of the in the game when the shot was taken versus you know first five minutes last five minutes taking account maybe some some players come to the game a little bit too hyped up and will overshoot and then towards the end of the game you start when the fatigue starts to come in mm -hmm. it starts to affect how their how their bodies react so we looked at the uh frequency of air ball attempts based on quarter okay and we thought if it, it is indeed fatigue air balls are more likely to happen in the last quarter we did not find a significant effect but it's not a very good way to look at it because you know players are substituting in and out, so we did not control for that. But general, as a general trend, we did not find more air balls in the end of the game as opposed to the beginning of the game. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I I did not I did not do any uh, I did not. But there is there is a line of research uh, looking into that because it's again it's a very 
um, it's a it, it's a unique situation, right? Where you have it, you minimize the factors, right? So you have the kicker, you have the goalkeeper, uh, and there's fascinating research coming specifically about penalty kicks, but unfortunately not from my own. How many of these kinds of projects are you doing in a semester? Ooh. Uh, I probably uh, juggle three or four, um, you know, at various stages a um, semester. Are you open to ideas? Come yeah, yeah, well, go, by all means. By, <laughs> uh, by all means, yes. You uh, take into account uh, free throws. So, uh, so that's a good question. Free throws, the way we treat free throws is if, uh, the, sub, if the previous, or the, previous or, the, um, or the subsequent shot was a free throw, if the player made both, it was considered success. If he missed both, it was failure. And if it was one and one, we did not include it in, in, the, uh, in the study. But I should tell you this. If a player launches an air ball from the free throw line, he's doomed. <laughs> <laughs> That's when the crowd, you know, everything stops, right? There's so much time to uh, to chant, and uh, yeah. So uh, no, yeah. we're working with a, an athlete, a basketball player, and they're confronted with that situation. We're going to have them have a plan on how to recover from that, and it, it may be not be possible based on the thing, but that'd be a really critical situation to help them to have try. A way to so maybe, if, if, maybe, so maybe if it's an away game, you can uh, uh, take them out, bring them back immediately. Coach, I don't know. Uh, that's for you th to decide. Uh, again, we see the, the impact mostly in away rather than home. I would assume that the layup has similar situations where you would have away, the icing, the energy of the crowd, easy layup, miss. Are you doing a study of that one too? Or <laughs> you can juggle only three or four projects at a time. <laughs> okay. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Right, so I, I know of a study that was done in the Italian league uh, about derbies, and that's actually where you do not see the home field advantage uh, because, again, you have the lack of travel, but you do have, so for if a certain, so usually they share the same stadium, uh, so sometimes they share the same stadium, but they do get a different ticket allocation. So if it's considered a home game, Maybe two thirds of the fans are going to be of your team, and a third is going to be of the away team. So we do not see the home and field advantage then. So there are different studies that support travel, and then do not. Then there are the other studies that do not do not find travel to be. What we know is specifically with travel, if you cross time zones. So if it's a, if it's if it's it, it has an effect absolutely. If you experience jet lag by crossing time zones. Uh, uh, if you don't cross time zones, the, the, the effect is really minor. So if you think about, um, yeah, so, so yeah, that's, that seems to be the, the, the biggest difference, the, the crossing of the time zones. That's when it takes its toll on the, on the traveling team. But again, there are many, many factors there. There's the travel, there is um, um, fans, uh, how, how used you are to the, to, the, to the field, right? Some sports, you have some peculiarities with the, with the way that the field is constructed. It's not necessarily uniform. Uh, so there's a lot, of, there are a lot of factors at play, which, and it's really nice to play and see what seems to be contributing under what circumstances. But again, it is a robust, consistent effect um, across all sports.